Hello and welcome to the first episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. It's Wednesday the 27th of February and in this, the first of our weekly half hour episodes, we're going to discuss the news highlights since we've been away. We'll also be talking about the latest happenings in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Mark and joining me this week are Tony. Good evening, Mark. Alan. Hello. And Laura. Hello. Well, there we go. Yeah. It's good to be back. It is. Yes. Excellent. Have we forgotten how to do this? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a bit different from normal. Yes. Sounds like a fun packed show. Yeah, that'll do. Yeah. <laughs> Now it's time for the news. And uh, in our first article, uh, Glyn Moody writes for The H on why it's time to stop using open source licenses. What's all is this it? about? This is a, a bit of a, a controversial topic. He's, he's arguing that copyleft licenses like GPL have declined as companies no longer need the license to compel them in yeah, order so, to contribute code back. So what he's saying is that companies get open source now. Uh, so okay. that you don't have to have a term in your license which says y- if you, you make changes, you have to distribute the code of those changes because people get that it's a good idea to do it. So in that case, you don't need the the sort of compelling of the license. Enforcement. Right. Enforcement, yeah, there we go. So you, the you, FSF you, can pack up and go home now. That, that, seems, to be, that seems to be what he's, what he's arguing, yeah. Well, and given he's the head of the open source, um, what's it called? Open thing. Open thing, uh, yes, isn't he head of the, um, OSI? the people who OSI? Yeah, it, people Simon Phipps. The, he's, Simon Phipps. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, um, ignore me. So <laughs> essentially, the argument is that corporations have got a conscience now. Partly, yeah, mm. but but also, I mean, what he's what he's really saying, what what he comes down to in the end is that you should just um, dedicate everything to, to the public domain if such a thing exists, or n- not have not claim copyright over things right. because well the the idea of a non copyleft open source license is basically to ensure that if people reuse your code then they say that you wrote the original code however in practice all all a, a license which so like the bsd license says that you have to do that and not a lot else but in practice you could just have a credit somewhere in an, an about screen which no one ever sees so that doesn't really get developers you know the the um, credit. The credit of the recognition that right. they want, but having your code published on GitHub does that anyway, and you don't need a particular license with your code to be able to do that. Okay. Does this come about because companies are already using this as a way to you know, do their open core thing, where they have their open source bit and then they have their plugins on top? And because everyone's now moving to this model, or a lot of companies are moving to that model, it makes it kind of redundant. I don't. Well, I don't know. I think. Um, well, part part of the problem actually comes from the developer's point of view. There's this this term that's been bandied about a bit recently called post open source software. Which <laughs> it, wow, I've not heard that. No, it's it, it, <laughs> Is yeah, that like exactly. Post PC arena. It's yeah, like right. post hardcore music. Um, <laughs> yeah, basically the idea being that people just pu- publish stuff on a on a um, on a site like GitHub with no license attached to it on the assumption that you, we don't need to bother with that license, man. Right. It's, ah, you know, hipsters. that's that's the... the Hipster license. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay, I get you. When, you know, the idea being, oh, you know, we'll just take it and do what we want with it. There's no need to bother with, with licensing terms. Oh, RMS would have a fit. Well, yeah, the problem with that is what that actually means in practice is that they're publishing it all rights reserved and no one can use anything. So if a company did a say... Default. Exactly. If a company did say, oh, that looks really useful, we could use that in our products, their lawyers would say, no way, you can't touch that with a barge pole. Because the uh, thing about a license is it does define clearly and unambiguously yeah. what the terms yes. are. Yes. So yeah, I mean, another thing which would do that would be a public domain dedication, which right. is what Glyn is suggesting in his uh, in his article. And public domain has always been the most free of ways to make software or any other material available. Yeah. The uh, Richard Stormont problem is that it means that people can take it and incorporate it into closed source software. <laughs> Sorry, the Richard Stormont problem. problem. That, was, that sounds like a really bad like band 70s. in the seventies. No, yeah. no, no, I was thinking of TV show with two leather chairs and a black uh, background. Okay. Like two was, people sat there discussing was, the Richard Stormont. It was the Alan problem. Parsons project, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, hmm. 
uh, yes, <laughs> but the whole, the whole point of the GPL is that uh, people, anybody, be it a company or an individual, can't then include uh, GPL licensed software in closed source binaries, make it better, but keep those uh, clo- uh, those changes and improvements internal. Yeah, exactly. That's what it's. That's that's what makes free software free. Yeah, but having everything public domain doesn't stop people doing that. It doesn't. No, it does. It does. Yeah, that doesn't offer the same protection if that's how you look at it that, yeah. that the gp or the copyleft licensing like the gpl does my brain just keeps looping <laughs> <laughs> i think glenn moody spent more time thinking about it he's dedicated most of his life to thinking about this kind of thing i just keep going but what if oh but does that matter what was the point of that in the first place why do we do this <laughs> what's happening <laughs> there's a bowl of petunias <laughs> Okay. I think I'll shut down now. <laughs> okay, well, we'll leave Glyn to the licensing. Yeah. And, what uh, else has happened while we've been away then? I don't know. As soon as we went off the air, bags <laughs> of stuff started happening in the Ubuntu <laughs> arena that, you know, somebody in this room probably knew about, but obviously wasn't able to tell us for various <laughs> legal reasons. Um, but yeah, no, didn't more, say, it's well, not you might legal stay reasons. At, it's just that I want to carry on being employed. Yes. <laughs> That's all. Um, yeah, but it didn't sort of say, oh, well, you might want to stay on air through, <laughs> oh, <laughs> through yeah, January. A, look, I've been stung by giving people clues like that in the past so i'm not going to do it again <laughs> keep these months free in your calendar so what has been going on then tony tell us i don't know but that's it now until december yeah so yeah there'll be no more news the rest of the year <laughs> uh, ubuntu has announced their developer kits for ubuntu on phones and tablets yes yeah, so there's an sdk what's uh, an sdk a software development kit so developers can start writing applications for the new thing which is the ubuntu phone and the ubuntu tablet which right. actually is the same software, really, that runs on both. Um, and uh, an extension to that is the same software could run on your desktop or your TV or your cloud or, you know, any any device. So it's, it's so I could do AppGet install LibreOffice on my Ubuntu tablet and it would run? <laughs> you could, uh, whether you'd want to, um, is, is another matter. But actually, you could try and it probably wouldn't run because... Uh, the way the tablet's been implemented is um, doesn't have X. So ah, it doesn't have X. No, it doesn't right. have X. So, so uh, yeah, there was a big announcement at the beginning of the year for Ubuntu Phone. Yeah, and then it was shown off at CES, and then there was another announcement just a couple of weeks back um, uh, about the tablet last and week. In fact, was, yes, and then that was uh, shown off or is being shown off right now at uh, Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. Cool. So there's three things there: there's the phone, the tablet, and the SDK. Right. Okay. Can people buy one? Not yet. Okay. Well, you could you could buy yourself a Nexus 4 yep. or a Nexus 10 yep. or any one of a number of other devices that the community have rallied around and ported it to. So we wrote a porting guide on the wiki oh, really? that showed uh, what you need to do to get this from our images that we've created because we can't support every single device. Yep. Yeah, no. We just don't have the resources. Mm. So we've picked like the ones that we know we can create images for. So there's four devices that we've created images for. They're Nexus devices, which makes it easy for us because they're unlocked. Um, but um, people in the community can then take those images and the source code and you know whatever else they need and smush it together and put it on other devices. I think there's been like 30 people sign up with different devices cool. and they're all listed on the wiki and there's 10 have already been done and every day there's like new people stepping up to port it across to other devices. So I can actually download an image for my Nexus 4 now and yes. run Ubuntu phone on there? Yes. Cool. Can, can, do you have to wipe the existing installation? So the, the instructions that we've got you wipe it and you lose everything. You lose yeah. your Android install, you lose all of your data. Yeah. Uh, and it will wipe it and put it clean. Some people have been monkeying around with multi-boot systems and, and have got those working with dual boot kind of stuff so they can switch between Android and Ubuntu. Um, we didn't test that because we uh-huh. were just looking at clean mm-hmm. installs, but people in the community are writing documentation showing how to do that. So, And I've wow. had people tweeting me saying I'm dual booting. Cool. So nice. the, the key thing is that this is a developer preview. It, <laughs> it doesn't fully work. Um, so so you won't be able to make phone calls? Yeah, you can make phone calls. Uh, cool. so that's one of the things. So that's that's can. one up on um, what was it? Open Maloco, <laughs> open down in Alpha Open Maloco. <laughs> <laughs> open Maloco. That's yeah. the one. Okay. Oh, uh, the one that Hugo there, had. There are some. There are some tricky things like um, if your SIM is locked and stuff that makes it harder. And you know there are, there are loads of UI things we haven't done yet. Yeah. So there's like placeholders for various things, but you know 
we're very clear that this is a developer preview so that people can get a device and they can open Cute Creator on their Ubuntu PC mm-hmm. and they can press a couple of buttons and squirt their code down to the phone and it run on the phone. And as you saw earlier on, we did exactly that yeah. with some code you And in written. fact, yeah, I wrote, I wrote a little app uh, in QML, which is the, the development language for uh, the phone environment, which is a, a declarative version of Cute, which has been around for a while. In fact, it was what... Um, the Unity 2D was written in for a while, wasn't it? Uh, it was cute. I don't think it was QML oh, okay. completely. I don't know. Okay. So, mm. yeah, but that also lets you use some C++ in the back end if you want to do mm. things like hardware accelerated graphics. So we're trying to encourage people to use um, pure QML. Yeah. Because if it's pure QML, then if you write something that's in pure QML and it runs on the phone. It'll also run on the tablet, you know, the TV, the desktop, run on all of them. Right. So long as the form factor adjusts you know, yes. appropriately for portrait landscape and big screen and all that kind of stuff. But the same code will run. You don't need to rebuild it, recompile it. I see. Whereas if you build a C++ app, then it's got to be built for ARM and x86 uh, and yeah. you know, oh, whatever, okay. other, whatever other platforms, which is why we're trying to encourage people to write, write QML apps if they can. Um, but that doesn't mean we're dismissing all other languages. It just yeah. means that's the preferred way because that enables it to run everywhere. And, you know, you could run phone apps on your TV or on your desktop or, or on the tablet. Mm. And, of course, it integrates with the, the Unity web app API as well. Yeah. So things like Facebook and Twitter work sort of like native apps. Yeah, there's the, we get a big win if we, if we uh, support HTML5 mm. because, you know, there's loads of people out there already doing HTML5 apps. So if we support it, then... Boom, we've got a whole boatload of apps that we can use straight off the bat without having to rewrite absolutely everything. So how does it work? How does it differ from what you would get if you're running an Ubuntu desktop? Uh, at the moment, it's it's quite different because it's based on the Android kernel and we're using the Android drivers. So uh, that mean, that makes it easy for us to support Android devices. That's, that's, what, that's why it's very easy to port across. If your device already runs android which right. android phones do funnily yeah. enough um then we're sat on top of that so you know the underlying stuff is compatible with the hardware yeah and then you just put the ubuntu stuff on top yeah there, there's yeah, some, i should be there's an some... engineering manager for <laughs> <laughs> there's some there's some glue in the middle and um we've we've used some some um other open source tools like there's um lib hybris is one of the things that we use which came out of yola uh, for their uh, Selfish phone. Okay. Yeah. Um, so a couple of the guys who started developing that, we picked up some of that and um, we're using that and we're passing our fixes upstream to them as well. Okay. Um, and that, that allows us to have um, Ubuntu sat on top of an Android kernel and as to talk through to the, uh, the devices that Android talks to underneath. Okay. So what does it look like? Uh, it looks pretty it's quite beautiful. shiny. How, yeah. do, how, how does it work as an interface? What do people see that's different from Unity on the desktop? So on the desktop, it's not touch. It's not built for touch. I mean, everyone keeps saying Unity on the desktop is like it's a touch environment, and it quite plainly is because <laughs> there's loads of keyboard shortcuts, and you know, it's yeah. free, and the the things you hit with your finger are tiny. Um, so it's 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 built for it's built for touch, and one of the main uh, changes is the the swiping gestures okay so there's no there's no physical buttons on the device you swipe up from the bottom to bring up menus swipe in from the left to get to your application swipe in from the right to switch applications and swipe down from the top to do indicators and that's actually similar to the desktop so the launchers mm. on the left and the indicators at the top you know there's yeah. there's some similarities but we've gone a bit further for touch okay so will there be integration between the ubuntu desktop and Ubuntu running on mobile devices. Um, so, so it, ev- eventually, yeah, they'll all be this, they'll all look similar, right? And they're, they're, there will be uniformity across them. At the moment, they're not. You know, the the one that's built mm. on the phone is built on QML, and the one in the desktop is built on Compiz. Mm. Isn't um, there this idea though that you right. could you could take your Ubuntu phone, and you could dock it into a tablet, and then you could run mobile apps and tablet apps side by side. <laughs> And then you can attach a screen and keyboard and use it like a desktop. So the convergence story. That's it, to the yes. converge- <laughs> convergence story. There yeah. we go, yes. Yeah, exactly that. You, you can take a, a phone, attach it to a piece of bigger glass. You've got a tablet. Attach it to a screen and a keyboard and it's a PC. Mm. Uh, attach it to a 50-inch TV and it becomes a TV interface. Cool. And, and Unity should detect those different 
uh, mm. environments and be able to intelligently decide, well, there's a keyboard and mouse present and I'm plugged into a um, a 23-inch screen, therefore I'm probably being a desktop now. Yeah. Um, whereas when it detects all those things go away, um, then chances are it's been unplugged from the dock and it's now been put in a pocket, so it should be a phone mode. Mm. So, it, yeah, it, it, uh, Unity should be multi-personality across all those devices, and that's, that's, that's the ultimate goal. But like I say, it's not there yet, but that's the aspiration. Where does it leave Ubuntu for Android? Well... So, in the dust. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all, actually. Ubuntu for Android is just a separate project. Right. And that still exists, and I expect that will come to market at some point right. this year. Oh, okay. Um, and you'd be able to uh, run an Android experience on your phone, yeah. and then when you dock it, you get the Ubuntu experience. Not that I want to try running LibreOffice on my phone, <laughs> but no, uh, is it necessary for people to redevelop their apps in the new languages and new frameworks that we were talking about? So if you've got a desktop app like LibreOffice, do you have to rewrite it for mobile? Do you really want to run LibreOffice on a phone? It's Seriously. an example. Okay, yeah, for, for example, if you have, if really you have an it. app which currently works, is not written in QML, mm-hmm. it runs... It's an X Windows app. It's, it's an app in the software centre. Yeah, mm-hmm. is there a way of getting it without re- redeveloping it onto a tablet? Uh, so not, for example, not currently. Right. Okay. It might be that in the future there are em- emulation layers that allow uh, simple X apps to run on the yeah. phone. Okay. That's not ideal though. No. Um, be good if you could just recompile automatically. Yeah, that would be lovely. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, tr- but, the trouble is, what do you recompile because? And just getting the code to run doesn't get an interface that works. Plus, no, that's plus true. a lot of the stuff on the desktop is, is dependent upon stuff like GTK, mm. which isn't on the phone. So, you know, you're yes, you're going to have to write either new apps or, you know, rebuild your apps or strip your apps down in some way. But people have already started doing that. We've already got a library of uh, of apps where people in the community have started writing, you know, new apps for the phone. Cool. Hmm. And think- we're being approached by you know, other people who have their existing apps who want to write those new components that make it work on our phone. Mm. I think it's fair to say there's a lot of excitement and interest in our IRC channel about Ubuntu on phones at the moment. Oh, crikey. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about it during the coming year. A couple of other news stories that caught our eye while we've been off the air. One has been a dispute over the name Python. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, this is a bit sad, really, isn't it? Yeah. It couldn't come to an amicable end. What, what actually happened? Um, well, a friend of the show, Simon Phipps, has been reporting on this for uh, some time. Basically, there was a company who, ho- who registered the domain uh, Python, I think python.co.uk, yeah. um, here in the UK uh, a long time ago and didn't really use it for anything um, and occasionally use it to sell an email service and things, but it was essentially wasn't marketing it. Yeah, most time it just redirected to one of their other domains anyway. Yeah, and then they tried to trademark the term Python in any sort of computing sense. Yeah. So they're, a, they're a hosting company. They started up a product called Python Cloud, which is not, not it's just, it's a cloud service. It's not anything to do with the Python language. Yeah. Right. They just had that brand name yeah. that they wanted to use. Yeah. So they tried to trademark that, which would, of course, cause problems for anybody trying to use or trying to market, essentially, the Python, Python. programming language. Yeah. Um. So that's not very friendly. And the Python programming language, I believe, predates their um, registration of the domain anyway. I think so, yes. Um, and people in the community got a bit stroppy about it from yeah, the sounds well, the, of things, which obviously then upset people. Basically, yeah. if someone if someone applies a trademark applies for a trademark, then you can, you know, people can object to it and say, you know, these people shouldn't have rights over that name because, you know, that it could be it could be a cause of a confusion with this product with a similar name or whatever. It's the prior art argument it does highlight how you know we you know if i say if i if i out of the blue said the word python you'd all know that i was talking about the programming language Mm. for people outside this room and outside our bubble they might think you're talking about snake or they might think you're talking about monty python yeah Yeah. that'd be the other thing i'd think of yeah (laughs) and and you know, for these these people who work in the IT industry, mm. you doing something that you would expect them to know about this stuff, mm. but they're, they, you know, they don't. As, they as don't. A, particularly as a hosting company. Yeah. Yes. It seems odd that they'd be allowed to trademark it. Well, this is this is what why why the community backlash happened because the Python Software Foundation said we need people to object to this to show the that intellectual property up. office that that this name means something else to a lot of people. So it's like if yeah if somebody tried to 
um, I don't know, trademark Mars and people said, oh, but I think of Mars as chocolate and you're trying to... But that's fine, as long as it's not in the same domain. Yes, but okay. Yeah, for if example, they were trying to do another someone... chocolate bar that was Mars, that yeah, would be a problem. Sorry, yes. And they said, I think of Mars as yeah. that caramelly thing, not your nutty But thing. as you say, the Python's all in the computing domain. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So Opera has is switching to WebKit instead of their existing engine, which is called Presto. I believe so. Pierre? Yes. Then yeah, that's clo- closed source and WebKit's open source, which uh, is good. Yay. WebKit is already <laughs> used for Safari, I believe. Safari, and Chrome, Chrome, um, Android browser, so this iPhone makes browser. Lots of other things. So this um, makes life easier for web developers. They only have to develop for, develop for WebKit or no, not. Firefox uh, uses Gecko. Sorry, uh, if they develop uh, for WebKit, it is compatible across all the browsers using WebKit. Ah, yes. Uh, is it, that the case? Yeah, but you shouldn't do that. You should develop right. for standards, not for the things that WebKit is implemented. Except especially. for IE. If you test in Safari using WebKit, it will be compatible. It will work with all other WebKit as browsers. As long as you've, you've followed standards, not followed yes. WebKit special shims and stuff. Right. Which the worry is that people will now say, oh, pretty much everything's WebKit. So everything that WebKit has implemented, I'll use and not bother with making sure that things work everywhere else. Kind of like they did with IE6, where they said, oh, everyone uses IE6. So I'll make a page which uses certain things that work in IE, but not in everything else. And they came to regret it. Yes. Mm. So what else uses WebKit? Um, everything, everything. Every, everything that's not Firefox and IE that's a web browser now. Chrome, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Cr- Chrome, Safari, um, Conqueror, um, yeah, yeah. Dillo. <laughs> oh, there, there's one or two. Leaks. There's one or two odd little ones w- that use Get. Gecko and yeah, don't have a yeah. rendering engine and things like that. But yeah, so um, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, I, cool, excellent. Okay. Well, I think that probably is all we've got time for to round up the news on this episode and everything we've missed in the last month and a half. <laughs> <laughs> the Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If there's something you think we should talk about or someone we should talk to, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And remember, if we don't hear from you, we might not have enough content. And that can only mean one thing, more quizzes. And we're back. You might remember... (laughs) As if you weren't sure. Um, you might remember we used to have a segment called Bit About Ubuntu. We rebranded it to Community News, including events. Gerald. So this is formerly known as Gerald, formerly known as the Ecosphere. Yeah. yeah. It's going really well. Um, okay, so <laughs> the same stack of uh, things that happened in the Ubuntu community. We're not going to try and recap everything over the last two or three months. Um, but the first thing that caught my eye was um, a potential redesign for Totem, the movie player that's in Ubuntu. <laughs> Um, of its user interface and it was rather nice unfortunately the screenshot that i looked at has disappeared from the internet what's changed it's all shiny it looked like it could fit in well with um something like unity where there's lots of translucency um Mm. in the ui um so this is a proposed design from the community person or something i got the impression it was just uh somebody in the community had mocked it up it looked very nice with the idea of the uh the toolbar that appears over a playing movie being sort of translucent so you can still click on it and interact with it but you can see what's going on it's in the background intrusive. yeah so totem has had an update or recently uh the version that's in raring um they removed something that i don't know what it is about the known developers who decide to remove stuff but they've removed the file open dialogue <laughs> you, no, uh, that's pointless isn't it that yeah, one? nobody needs that yes but I, I guess i'm supposed to double click on videos rather than open the video player and then go file open um or i go to the playlist and then hit the plus button and go and find a video and or then use add your it file to manager playlist. and drag it in or something so you've got lots of options yeah, I have, but not the one option that I used to use. <laughs> well, control O, does that still work? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's literally just a menu item that's gone. Boss. Well, as a Unity user, we know you're very, uh, a very big fan of keyboard shortcuts. No, no, so. it's all touch. I've been poking the screen <laughs> oh, right. and it's just not working. He's been poking the screen on his non-touch screen laptop. <laughs> yes, exactly. Mashing it with his fist. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, but yes, a shame it disappeared because it looked really sweet and uh, it mm. might come to pass so yet. So that's uh, a mission for the community is go and find that screenshot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Um, so the Ubuntu Developer Summit, which were every six months, yeah. and at a the selection start of every release cycle was it? Yeah. Uh, no, the, uh, well, yeah, yeah. At the, the end, end, the next one. Start, yes. And they'd ship a whole bunch of developers across to meet everybody in person. Now they're going to be every three months, mm -hmm. but virtual. Yeah, shorter. Yes. And shorter. Only, well, not a week. Yeah, they're only last. Well, the last, the last one was four days. Uh, in person, and yes. This, what is it now? Two days. Two days two every days. three months. So I guess is this just a cost-cutting exercise for Canonical. <laughs> <laughs> so, Austerity bites. So do you know <laughs> the last the last UDS uh, was in Copenhagen, right? And we had to hire the biggest convention center in Scandinavia yeah. to get everyone in. Wow. Okay. It, then. It's grown to a lot. So. Uh, yeah, it costs a fair bit of money yeah. to do it. And I suppose, yeah, becoming increasingly a logistical nightmare as Canonical bit, and yes. the community both grow. So there's that, that, that I'm sure, plays a part. Yeah. Um, but also, leading up to um, phone and tablet, yeah. is no secret that we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. yeah. And having one UDS, that the next one isn't actually for another, what, two months, beginning mm -hmm. of May... Uh, Your schedules mm. don't line up, do and, they? And then another one in October. You know, we we need to get going on this stuff and make decisions like now yeah. about the stuff yeah. that's going to happen in the desktop and the phone and the tablet and server. We've got to start making decisions, and to do that, we all need to get together a a, a lot quicker mm. and leaner and more often. There is a potential downside, though, which is that there are a few. The, <laughs> but one of the things people have always said about UDS is that it's great to meet in face to face and have yeah. a beer and hang out with people. Um, and it helps carry you through the next six months worth of development using just text and, mm. and Google Hangouts and stuff. It really helps get the human interaction going. Yeah. But uh, between previous UDSs, like we're talking six to eight months ago and, and beyond backwards, we didn't have Hangouts. And yeah. we've used Hangouts a lot as a company internally. We use them all the time. Almost all of our company meetings are... This if, is Google Hangouts, not just some cool guys <laughs> on the, on the <laughs> street yeah, corner. Google Hangouts. So there's like up to 10 people with their webcams on mm. uh, having a discussion. So you, you get FaceTime. Okay, it's not exactly the same as, you know, being in the same room as people and going out for beer in the evening and, you know, playing cards or even the corridor conversations that you get at UDS. Yeah. yeah. You know, that you, you're missing out on those. But... You know, we've got to make some sacrifices for the next year to get this stuff done. And, you know, we can't just look back with fondness and say how, you know, great previous UDSs were. We've got to look forward and, and you know, get stuff done. Interesting times, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's next, Mark? Um, Hack and Talk, yes. Laura Tchaikovsky's event, uh, which is a, a technology-related bar camp in London. Yes, it's on Saturday the 9th of March from 11am till 5pm. Um, and you can basically go along and hang, hang out. And talk. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you need, to, you need to book a ticket. Uh, we'll put the link uh, in the show notes. Yeah. Hack, hack and talk. Uh, Eventbrite thing. Uh, just go there and get a ticket. And it's at Google's uh, London campus. So if you've yes. not checked that out before, it's a good opportunity to have a poke around. Yeah. She's got some nice bit of space. They've got a like a huge canteen area, and uh, Laura's managed to get that space for uh, Hack and Talk. Cool. Should be good fun. I saw Wicked. that on MasterChef, in fact. They could <laughs> really? there. Really? Yes. <laughs> I don't think they'll be doing that at the same time. Okay. What's next? Uh, we've uh, got a blog post which details the new daily builds of the Ubuntu phone and tablet images. So we oh, put yeah. out a developer preview. Um, and now we're doing daily images and there's a lovely little tool called Fablet Flash. <laughs> <laughs> and you just run Fablet Flash minus L to get the latest or Fablet Flash minus B to do a bootstrap of a clean device with your Android device, your supported Android device plugged in, your Nexus 4, Nexus 7, Nexus 10 or whatever. And it will just download the image and blat it over the top. It's brilliant. Cool. It's really good. It's good to keep up to date with the, you know, the, the images. Nice. Brilliant. There's a couple of events to tell you about as well. One is the Northeast GNU Linux Fest, which is happening on March the 16th and 17th at Harvard University. So that's northeast of the USA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, not Newcastle. Not, oh, Newcastle. Oh, yeah. So yeah. That is really northeast, isn't it? And finally, Open Source Junction, um, which is an event run, being run by 
me at work and the rest Ooh. of my team, um, which is taking place on the 14th and 15th of March. That's in a couple of weeks at Trinity College in Oxford. And it's free and Ooh. it's on the subject of open source hardware meets open source software. So if you're interested in hardware Ooh. hacking and open source hardware and that kind of stuff, uh, then it should be interesting. We've got some really cool speakers lined up. Um, if you go to osj4.eventbrite.co.uk, you can get a ticket and see what's going on, and it should be awesome. That sounds awesome. That's all for this episode. Join us next time where we'll be interviewing Elizabeth Krombach and going over your feedback and having some gooey love. <laughs> we should explain. It's not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> we will explain. No, no we won't. <laughs> it <laughs> well, hopefully doesn't we have to be now. <laughs> it is a new segment. Yes. Listeners, calm down. Well, we hope you uh, enjoyed our first shorter format episode. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>